I want to talk a little bit about irony because I listened to an interview with you, a radio interview, where you talk about loans yeah. and how AI is going to be, it's, just, it's much better than a person doing a loan, yes. determining it. Right. Um, and the person said in the interview, well, we've got to take a quick break, and then they had an ad for Quicken Loans, and I just thought how humorous. <laughs> yeah. um, do you sit there and look and say, that job's gone, that job's gone, uh, this is going to, I mean, how do you view the world? Because you know what the future looks like, we don't. Well, it's actually fairly easy to, to explain, so everyone can make projections. AI for the next 10 or 15 years will largely do repetitive tasks for single domains uh, and routine tasks for which a lot of data can be gathered. So if a job or task doesn't fall into that category, then it's presumed safe. So we can look at various jobs. So let's say uh, telemarketing, definitely routine, uh, customer service, uh, back-end processing of data, shuffling paper, entry-level accountant, paralegal, um, entry-level research assistant, finding information on the web, those jobs will be largely, if not completely, displaced by AI because it's merely software. Uh, also, uh, physical labor jobs, for example, visual inspection of um, uh, you know, IC boards and phones or, or garment and uh, agricultural jobs such as um, picking fruits and um, uh, watering and fertilizing plants, uh, dishwashers. Uh, we can pretty much project those types of jobs will be gone as well. Uh, and then AI will com continue to advance. Uh, it turns out uh, some jobs are harder because of the high level of uh, hand-eye coordination or uh, our fingers, the dexterity. Uh, that may put it a little bit farther out, such as building an iPhone. That's a little bit difficult, but eventually that will be done uh, as well. Dealing with uh, uncertain environments. So clean any room. That's pretty hard, uh, unless you're just a Roomba cleaning the, the floor. Uh, so that's pretty hard because every room is different. Every owner's expectation is, uh, is different. Um, and uh, other things difficult would be creativity, coming up with a new concept. Uh, strategically plan, uh, think about things that aren't quantitatively comparable, like a CEO who has to think about financial results, branding, employee satisfaction, etc. Um, and um, also empathy, the human-to-human -human connection, compassion, empathy, human connection and trust that a machine cannot do. So I hopefully I've outlined um, many things that AI will do, many things AI will likely do, and many things AI currently uh, we don't see any roadmap of uh, doing. There's a lot of people who would hear what you just said and, and not want to hear it. And, and I think of the last presidential election in the United States, you had a candidate who went to West Virginia and said, I'm bringing the coal mine jobs back. Mm -hmm. yeah. And everyone kind of on the face of it, even the coal miners, I think, think, well, coal's not the future. That's not going to happen. And yet people went out and voted in West Virginia. Oh, this guy's going to bring my job back. Yeah. Um, what about you know, that fear that I'm going to lose my job and having to retrain for something, maybe I don't want to do that. Uh, what would you say to people who are watching this and probably antsy about this future that you just described? Well, for people, say, in their 50s, they probably don't have to worry too much because um, just because AI can do part of your job doesn't mean it will because your employer has to decide. Does it want to adopt AI? Does it understand AI? Uh, or does it care about the employees? Will it give employees a chance to new, learn new skills? Also, many governments and regulations and labor unions will make it not so easy for jobs to be displaced. So if someone's in the 50s and the jobs appear possibly displaceable in the next 10 to 15 years, well, um, you'll be retired already, so it's really not, not a big problem. The shipping business is also changing. Online retailers are now using smart warehouses manned by cutting-edge robots. These Wi-Fi-equipped, self-charging machines are responsible for moving goods in the warehouse. They retrieve products to their human colleagues, who then pack and ship it to customers worldwide. Kai-Fu Lee has become a business incubator. His facilities help new and startup companies develop by providing funds, management, training, and the data needed to grow. So is this kind of your wall of fame? Talk yeah. to me about this. This is a wall of all of our companies over three or five hundred million dollars valuation. Uh, a lot of the more recent companies are AI companies. 
for example, this is a company called AI Innovation. Mm. They built that auto cashier oh, that we saw, yeah. and they have automatic vending machines and uh, smart uh, retail and manufacturing solutions. Uh, another autonomous vehicle company. This is China's um, first. <laughs> he unicorn. doesn't look old enough to drive a car. I mean, these are young guys, aren't they? Yeah, he's in his 20s. Wow. And uh, he is uh, the CEO of the autonomous vehicle company called um, Momenta. Here's another really interesting one. Uh, he is the CEO of Zhui Yi uh, Bot. And it's a conversational robot for doing customer service, call center, and support and uh, interaction with customers. When they come in and pitch you, yeah. and you're as young as him, your knees have got to be knocking talking to somebody like you. I mean, what do you look for in these people? Is it enthusiasm, passion? Well, certainly, I think all, all of them have that, and uh, hard work, ability to lead the team, and as well as the execution. Because in China, the CEO's ability to execute, roll up uh, their sleeves and get, get everything, whatever it takes, done, and to win in the market is extremely important, competitiveness. You're, you're dynamite. <laughs> Another young guy. He was. This was. <laughs> he's uh, nine years older now. Yeah. He was 25. Yeah. Wow. Google engineer. Wow. This is just wild. Yes. In the beginning, there were no AI companies. We these were mobile companies, and most of them were sold to Baidu, Alibaba, or Tencent, uh, because they were behind and they bought these companies to uh, uh, supercharge their. Uh, wow. Their, and these people were worth. Tons now, right? Uh, it, uh, yes, they, they're, all, they're all, they've all done very well. Uh, the ones that have done the most well are the unicorns. This is about a $1 billion company mark. This is a $5 billion mark. So you can see there are a couple of, couple of those. Uh, here's a $5 billion mark. Jeez. And um, all the others are probably half a billion or so. Here's another uh, AI company doing AI for banking. Um, and this is the WeWork of China. Uh, what are the unicorns? This is Mobike. Oh, uh, that Mobike. kind of took over China by storm and now has been bought by Meituan for about over almost $3 billion. This is a robotic company uh, that's building robotics and semiconductors for AI, also a uh, unicorn. And this one, uh, a little bit different, this one's the n most popular uh, internet TV show. Yeah, and uh, it's, a, it's a unicorn also. They're very, very popular. Uh, it's a series of shows built by the team. And this is another uh, semiconductor, uh, AI semiconductor company. Oh, another young guy. Huh? Oh, yeah. This one is in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. uh, they actually build smart phones in hotel rooms. And they're trying to make uh, hotel rooms into uh, smart hubs. And, uh, wow. yeah. and this one is the AI-enabled uh, supermarket. So wow. lots of unicorns here. And the government is also doing its part by building a $2 billion technology park dedicated to developing artificial intelligence. The campus is being constructed in the Mitugo district in western Beijing, next door to two of China's largest technical universities. Once completed, this will house up to 400 AI companies. I remember it was a kicker story in 2017, the machine beats the greatest Go player, and he is just overcome with emotion. Yeah. And that's one of the things you talk about is, is, is that emotional piece, because AI doesn't have emotion. Empathy, you talk a lot about empathy and the importance of empathy moving forward. Talk to me about how those kinds of jobs are gonna be more important. Well, as uh, AI and automation take over the boring, repetitive, emotionless jobs, uh, the jobs that we will need to amplify and emphasize are both our one, on the one side, the creative, strategic ones, on the other side, the compassionate, empathetic ones, because these are the core two things that uh, AI cannot do. Um, we have no idea how to program compassion, empathy. I think also, even if we started to emulate it with AI, I don't think people feel comfortable uh, confiding to a robot psy psychiatrist or to, or people feel they want a robot teacher or they want to see a robot doctor. Uh, so there is going to be more room for those jobs that may be very high-end jobs like physicians or may be uh, fairly easy to train jobs uh, going from physicians to practi nurse practitioners to nurses to orderly to um, uh, elderly care and uh, to at-home care. These jobs are going to increase because our longevity will increase 
and people over 80 will need five times as much care as people between 60 and 80. So there will be a natural increase in these job categories. And what we need to do is to make sure that people find these jobs to be desirable, reasonably paid, and have reasonable social status. Um, and, and these are jobs that uh, we wouldn't want uh, a robot to do. Um, I've had an entrepreneur who built a uh, elderly home robot and the elderly only uses one function, which is uh, video conference customer service. And then the customer service comes up, and then the elderly would say, why didn't my daughter call today? <laughs> Here's a picture of my uh, grandchild. So, so people want companionship. They want that connection uh, with people they love, with their relatives, or just with another caring human. And that's something that uh, AI just cannot do. Compassion in the healthcare industry is also needed, and AI-incorporated solutions could be the answer. Software company 12 Sigma Technologies uses deep learning to train an AI algorithm that helps doctors analyze CT scans. It means quicker and more accurate lung cancer diagnosis. The incorporation of AI into clinical practice not only enhances doctors' efficiency, but also improves their capability in coming up with a diagnosis by using data from top hospitals to less privileged ones, essentially leveling healthcare services provided to remote areas all across the country. How does this revolutionize medicine, do you think? I think um, it'll be a huge revolution to medicine, but it will take a rather long time. I think in terms of diagnosis, we're beginning to see AI making more accurate diagnosis than doctors in very, very specific um, types of cancers, uh, say skin cancer or certain types of lung cancer. And I think that will broaden, 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 and over time become generally better than the doctor. Um, and the doctor may still have some specialty or some judgment or some personal knowledge that he or she may override the computer. But I think in a 30, 40 year time frame, um, AI ought to be doing the great majority of the diagnosis, which will be much more accurate than the average doctor, which will bring down the cost of healthcare, which will elevate or change the type of job a doctor has. So the doctor is more a communicator with the patient, uh, a comforter, someone who gives the patient the, um, uh, the confidence that he or she will, will survive and overcome the disease and pay a lot more attention to um, improve the patient experience, to tease out the patient's um, um, hidden conditions or family relations and things like that. So the doctor's jobs actually become something different, more of a connector, empathetic, um, maybe doesn't require as much training. Um, most doctors spend all, all these smart people, best students, spend all the time memorizing the new kinds of treatments. That should be done by AI. So I think that's one big change. The other big change is uh, discovery of new drugs. Now it's just up to the scientist to come up with the new drugs. But AI can be a great assistant, a tool that can filter out all the possible spaces of drugs and things that they can um, cure, potentially. And, um, and, and, and pick the most likely ones that will succeed in clinical trials so that the doctor's work is uh, amplified. So before a doctor can invent one drug every three years, but now maybe 10 drugs in, in every three years, and that will dramatically improve the healthcare. But all this will take a long time because they require that we somehow have the faith to put something very private to ourselves, our health records, into a large database for the training just like um, Google or Amazon uh, or Alibaba put user data into training. But the data we felt we gave to Google and Alibaba is not so um, private, but the data we give to a health AI is very private. So how do we get people to do that? How do we get laws that um, will permit that and yet anonymize the data? So that will still be some obstacles we uh, have to overcome. Let me ask one final question, and, and it's a personal question. I remember lyrics from a song uh, from years ago, does it take a death to understand what a life is worth? And I want to ask about, does it take a death scare to reevaluate your life? Because you had one, um, and it did kind of help, uh, kind of shake you to the core and reevaluate your life. Talk to me about that experience and, and what it taught you about yourself and, and what you want out of life. Yes, okay. Uh, well, 
as an AI researcher and, an, uh, and a uh, venture capitalist and a <clears throat> former um, um, general manager at the large um, multi multinationals, I've always been a workaholic. And I think that's part of the success of the Chinese ecosystem we talked about. But um, really, I, when I had lymphoma and faced a possible death about uh, six years ago, it really made me rethink that when I thought my life could just have another 100 days, uh, I really didn't want to work for a single moment. I felt what was much more important is the uh, compassion that people displayed to me, the love from my family and friends and how much they cared about me and how selfless their love was and how little that I had um, understood, appreciated or repaid their love and that I determined if I should overcome disease, uh, knock on wood, <laughs> seem to be okay now, I'm in remission, I would uh, change my life, that I would continue to work and work pretty hard, but I would always put at the top priority uh, for people I love. So it became a work-life balance, and it's actually doable, because uh, when we talked about the tenacity and hard work, 100-hour weeks, which I used to work, I still work hard, but it's just that Whenever my family or friends needed something, I would make that a priority. And um, I may miss an important meeting as a result, but, um, and I would take time off uh, to write books, to reflect to, with my family and friends. And I think I live a much, much happier life as a result. But as it applies to this um, interview on AI, it also gave me the belief that compassion and love, which has uh, made me change my life is something that may be partially an answer to the AI challenges that brought about to humanity. That maybe we um, as um, ha inhabitants of the earth have become too obsessed with work. Starting with the industrial revolution and with every advancement of technology, you know, we actually work harder and harder. You know, in theory, email should make it make us write less because it's faster than writing on paper. But now we just write more emails. So our time continues to be soaked up by everything about work. And maybe artificial intelligence is something that's brought upon humanity, um, not just to bring a lot of value and wealth, but to liberate us from routine jobs. So we can have enough time to learn to appreciate uh, all those wonderful things that other things that we have love and compassion and the beautiful environment things that we love to do and that maybe AI will end up being um, liberating to us so we're no longer having to do anything routine so we can do what we love and think more about what it means to be human we'll leave you uh, on that upbeat note thanks so much for Thank your you. time really Thank appreciate you. it thanks